Hello friends, so in this video I will be talking about uh, Remdesivir and uh, I have just uh, reviewed an article of uh, role of Remdesivir in acute kidney injury or CKD because currently in COVID situation uh, Remdesivir is not being used in CKD patients or AKI patients because all the trials had excluded uh, the CKD or AKI patients in Remdesivir and it is considered sort of a contraindication. So in this video I will be talking about uh, what is the rationale of uh, not giving remdesivir and is it uh, factual at all uh, or should we change our practices and before that I will just take you through the compilation of all the trials that has happened in remdesivir uh, so that there is a sort of a preamble before we talk about its role in uh, AKI. So as you know remdesivir is a pro drug so it is not an active drug it produces an active component which acts against COVID and it's an ATP analog. So remdesivir was first brought in to be used for Ebola virus in 2014 but uh, it, it was not very effective against e Ebola and it had a very low efficacy against this virus. So in 2017 this uh, remdesivir was repositioned for uh, SARS-CoV-1 virus and then it was extrapolated on its uh, beneficial effects in uh, SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus and it is found to act on key enzymes of SARS-CoV-2 uh, so and based on this sort of a hypothesis uh, there have been trials that have been done to see whether it really translates into good clinical outcome and, uh, and the way it acts is it predominantly uh, impedes or stops the viral replication in SARS-CoV-2. So how does uh, the remdesivir acts? So when you look at the whole corona or COVID-19 virus and its effect on the cells. So COVID-19 has a spike S protein which binds, uh, we, we pretty much know all this basics because we have gone through this time and again. So this S protein binds to the ACE2 inhibitor and this gets endocytosis. So this undergoes a process of endocytosis and uh, this leads to uh, for, 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 to, to viral replication through RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Um, so the main replication of the viral RNA, so it gets endos, endocytosis happens and then an RNA is released and then this replication of this RNA happens or mediated by RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So and there is multiple copies of these uh, viral RNA that gets created. So and this viral RNA gets incorporated and forms new viruses and this virus exits out of the cells and replication happens. Uh, so how does this whole remdesivir act? So if you look at this uh, whole replication process, so remdesivir enters into the cells and it is since it's a pro drug it gets converted into this active component called GS441524. This active component gets embedded into the viral sequencing into the RNA sequencing as a defective component so because there is this embedding of this defective component in the viral sequencing or the RNA sequencing further replication of this uh, RNA virus by RNA dependent RNA polymerase does not happen because of the defective component that gets embedded by the remdesivir active component and it is also been recognized that this defective component that gets embedded by the remdesivir can be inactivated by exoribonuclease 3 5 exoribonuclease which is apparently produced by covid-19 virus so covid the viruses are a lot more intelligent that they do produce this 3 5 exoribonuclease which is known to uh, you know uh, undo the whole defective component that gets embedded in the uh, RNA sequencing and uh, because of this uh, clever sort of a action of uh, COVID-19 virus so the efficacy of remdesivir can be subdued or can be minimized so it all depends on uh, the viral strain uh, how effective it is in producing 3,5-exoribonuclease because this can deactivate the defective component embedded by this remdesivir into the viral sequencing or the RNA sequencing. So just let's look into this video which beautifully demonstrates as to how the remdesivir acts by preventing the viral replication through RNA dependent RNA. Remdesivir. remdesivir. In order to fly, viruses have full hurdles they need to overcome. Transmission, they have transmitted from host to host. 
Access, Access the need to bypass the security, security system, system of the human cell. cell. Replication, Replication of, virus of virus must hijack the cell's copy machinery, machinery to create copies of itself. Of itself. And, and apoptosis, it needs, needs to destroy the cell and move out to infect other cells. The genetic, the genetic encoding, encoding of the SARS-2 coronavirus is a single-stranded single RNA. After, After cell entry, the virus, virus co-opts the cell into producing copies. A key, a key enzyme, enzyme in this process is RNA polymerase, which synthesizes the, synthesize the nucleotide components that make up the RNA, RNA strand. Remdesivir appears, appears to this enzyme as as an OC, one, one of the nucleotides. The RNA, RNA polymerase grabs remdesivir and attaches it to the chain. But after, but after doing so, further, further nucleotides are unable to attach, thereby terminating the replication process. By, by preventing the completion of the replication process, remdesivir stops the pathogenesis to SARS coronavirus 2. So, so that's a beautiful video which pretty much demonstrates as to how the prodrug remdesivir gets embedded into the RNA sequencing and prevents for the replication. So what is the dosage of remdesivir? So it is given as a 200 mg as a bolus dose or a stat dose followed by 100 mg once a day for 9 days. So it is typically given as an infusion over 2 hours. And uh, what is the pharmacokinetics? So at a dose of 10 mg per kg. Um, it has been found that remdesivir gets actively absorbed into the brain, into the eyes and into the testes in 4 hours. And uh, the adverse effects of remdesivir are usually a little mild, so it can cause nausea, vomiting. Transaminitis is a distinctive adverse effects that has been reported in remdesivir. So they can be raised in the IAST and ALT levels. So now let's jump into the studies that has come so far randomized controlled trials looking at the efficacy of remdesivir. So the first study that came was by the Chinese group Wang et al. It came in Lancet 16th May 2020. So the trial was remdesivir in adults with severe COVID-19, a randomized double blind placebo controlled multicentric trial. So uh, the trial, the inclusion was they enrolled the patients within 12 days after the symptom onset of COVID-19 and they took the patients who had saturation less than 94% and PaO2 by FiO2 less than 300 millimeter mercury and they needed to have uh, CT findings or radiological findings of infiltrates present. So the dose they gave was the standard dose 200 mg once a day followed by 100 mg once a day for 9 days and concomitant use of lopinavir, ritonavir, interferon and corticosteroid was allowed in this particular trial and the primary endpoint was to look at the time for clinical recovery at day 28 and they took an ordinal scale uh, from a score of 1 to 6. So 1 considering it's a good outcome with discharge from hospital and 6 considered as death. So that was the primary endpoint they took. So the number of patients that were enrolled was 237 patients, 158 in the remdesivir group and 79 in the placebo group. So the primary endpoint which was to look at the time to clinical recovery at day 28, they found there was no difference between the remdesivir and placebo group. But what they interestingly found was if remdesivir was initiated uh, within 10 days of the onset of symptoms, they found there was a statistically significant faster recovery time in the remdesivir group. And they looked at the adverse events, there was no difference between the remdesivir and placebo group. So that, so that was sort of a positive study with an emphasis that if remdesivir is given within 10 days, I think the crux, the quintessence is giving it within 10 days of onset of symptoms, there was a faster recovery from the symptoms. So that's what was found. So following that uh, March trial by Chinese group, the US uh, people came out with this uh, particular paper uh, in NEJM on 10th April 2020 where this was not a randomized controlled trial, it was more sort of a cohort study where they looked at uh, how the clinical responsiveness was there in a group of patients where remdesivir was used, compassionate use of remdesivir for patients with severe COVID. So this was a cohort study of 53 patients uh, uh, who were given remdesivir whose saturation was less than 94% and this was sort of a multicentric trial so they, look, they looked at uh, the patients, 22 patients were from US, 22 was from Europe and 9 was from Japan. So they collated this data and they published this manuscript and the group of patients 57% or the 30 patients were mechanically ventilated and 4 patients were on ECMO. So what did they find? 
So basically they took these patients and saw how the clinical response was to the remdesivir. So they saw improved oxygenation happened in 68% of the patients and 57% of the patients uh, who, were, <clears throat> who were extubated successfully and interestingly they found the mortality in mechanically ventilated patients was relatively less compared to historic cohort and that was 18% and mortality in non-mechanical ventilated patients obviously was very less at 5% and 47% of the patients were successfully discharged and the, the total deaths was around 13%. So this was just an observation where they found that remdesivir seemed to have decent efficacy in reducing the mortality in ventilated patients and uh, facilitating discharge. <clears throat> so after this, this was a randomized control trial uh, which again came from the US authors. It came in NEGM 27th May. So the, here they looked at the effectiveness of remdesivir when it was given five, 5 days as opposed to the 10 days in patients with severe COVID. So this was a randomized control trial. So they took the patients whose saturation was less than 94% with lung infiltrates on imaging. So the primary endpoint was similar to the Wang study that came in where they looked at the primary endpoint as a clinical recovery at day 14 on an ordinal scale of uh, 1 to 7. So they had 237 patients. So 200 patients got remdesivir for 5 days and 197 patients got remdesivir for 10 days. So the day 14 clinical improvement by 2 points on the ordinal scale of 7 points was higher in remdesivir at 64% as compared to remdesivir which was given for 10 days at 54%. And they found the discharge was 60% in 5 days group as opposed to 52% in 10 days group. So it seemingly appeared that 5 days was good enough and they were comparable to giving remdesivir for 10 days. So here please bear in mind they compared not with the control group 5 day remdesivir versus 10 day remdesivir and the discharge uh, when remdesivir was given uh, when the symptom onset was less than 10 days happened more in the 5 day group at 62% as compared to the 10 day group and the mortality there was no significant difference between 5 day and 10 day group and clinical recovery time also was no different uh, when you compare to 5 day and 10 day group. So basically this randomized control trial showed that 5 days therapy of remdesivir was as effective as giving it for 10 days and there was no significant difference albeit if you give early remdesivir initiation the 5 days uh, treatment would suffice and it did lead to uh, symptom resolution and discharge in a much larger patient group than in 10 day group. So that again the quintessence was earlier you give so the better it is uh, and shorter would be the duration or the need for remdesivir. So this is a very interesting slide so I want listeners to just pay attention to this because the first slide obviously said the 5 day is no different to the 10 day uh, in severe COVID. So these are severe COVID patients uh, but then they did a post hoc analysis uh, in mechanically ventilated patients. As you see when they took the mechanically ventilated patients or patients who are on ECMO they looked at the mortality between the 5 day group and the 10 day group and they saw the uh, mortality uh, you know the, the day 14 deaths was much higher in the 5 day group as compared to the 10 day group because the 5 day group had a higher mortality of 40 percent as compared to 17 percent in the 10 day group. However, when they looked at the mortality in patients who are on NIV non-invasive ventilation or high frequency nasal oxygen day 14 deaths either you give 5 days or 10 days there was no difference. So this is a very important point so which goes on to say when typically we have severe COVID patients on NIV or HFNO so it goes on to say that 5 days therapy is good enough you don't need to give for 10 days but if someone is intubated mechanically ventilated possibly in that group you may have to give it for 10 days because uh, at least if you have to subscribe to this trial it appeared that it uh, reduces the mortality in that group and that was shown in this uh, figure pictorially where uh, you see the 10 day group had a lower mortality the, the violet one is the mortality as compared to the 40 percent in 5 day group. So the adverse effects that was reported in this randomized control trial was 9 percent had vomiting and 7 percent had uh, raised AST ALT levels and 8% had progression of the respiratory failure despite remdesivir and 7% had constipation. So predominantly they had GI symptoms and transaminitis which happened in 7% of the patients. Uh, 
So that's about all the trials. So we basically looked at four studies. So one by the Chinese group, one was by the US or the multicenter group from Europe, Japan and USA looking at a cohort sort of a patients. And the third one was a randomized controlled trial uh, which looked at uh, uh, basically the 5-day and 10-day remdesivir. So then this particular paper came which again came by the basically this trial was sponsored by the Gilead which manufactures uh, um, remdesivir. So the title was remdesivir for severe COVID-19 versus a cohort receiving standard of care. So this this is preprint, so it has not yet come in any journal. Uh, so this has come as a preprint manuscript. So as you see, this is a industry-sponsored sort of a study. The inclusion criteria was again they took patients whose saturation was less than 94%, and the primary endpoint, like the previous trials, they looked at day 14 recovery on the ordinal scale of 1 to 7, and the secondary endpoint they looked at mortality. And here they excluded patients whose AST and ALT was more than five times and they excluded patients whose creatinine clearance was less than 50 ml per minute and they excluded pregnant and the breastfeeding uh, patients. So the results, uh, so the interestingly, so when you read this whole manuscript, so I urge uh, the listeners who are interested in a bit of a statistical tweaking to please read this manuscript because this is preprint manuscript and uh, this heavily, heavily or uh, in the, dwells into a lot of statistical tweaking um, so, so I would say it is more of torturing the whole data to see how best they could uh, crystallize or take out the essence out of it. So they did something called inverse proportion treatment weighted uh, sort of an analysis. Uh, so for people who may be very uh, uh, you know familiar with the statistical jargon, so they did a propensity matching sort of a they, uh, matching of all the subjects between the two studies. So basically this was they took the data from two big studies uh, and then they did a lot of statistical tweaking and they compared the subjects between these two groups and tried to see what was the significance of remdesivir in this group and the whole matching so these were two uh, different studies they took the subjects and they tried to match the individuals by propensity matching scores and then they did this inverse proportion treatment weighted sort of an analysis and, uh, and when you read the manuscript, it is mentioned they did exclude a lot of patients. So there was a uh, typical selection bias because they excluded Italian data and the authors do say in this manuscript that uh, this data was excluded because the mortality in this Italian patients were much different to the mortality in other sort of a regions. So there was a uh, distinctly selection bias that you could see when you read this manuscript and there is a heavy, heavy statistical tweaking that has gone on to try to put patients in remdesivir group and the non-remdesivir group. So anyway, so the patients that were analyzed from these two studies and these studies were codenamed with a number and they took the patients and they did statistical tweaking and they put into remdesivir group and non-remdesivir group. So they had 312 patients selected in remdesivir. So these were very selective patients as you see they have taken and the control group had a bigger number of 818 patients and obviously what would you expect when so much of uh, torturing of uh, data that happens or statistical tweaking. So you would see a good benefit. So the day 14 recovery was significantly higher in remdesivir and they were statistically significant and day four, uh, 14 mortality was significantly less in remdesivir at 7.6 percent as compared to 12.5 percent and that was statistically significant and so this was a, a representation as you see this was the remdesivir group uh, where uh, recovery was much better and this was the mortality which was much lesser. So. Again friends, I think if you have to read this paper, you have to really read the full text of the manuscript because the whole manuscript dwells only on statistical tweaking as to how they have tried to match with propensity score, how they have used this inverse proportion treatment weighted scores and all sorts of a statistical jargon that has gone into uh, have a bias in selection between remdesivir and control group. So we cannot really make uh, much out of this paper because there is a heavy high voltage statistical stuff that has happened. Uh, to infuse sort of a bias into this uh, selection. So, so that's about the four trials that you see. So you could possibly give weightage to the first trial that came from China and possibly the third trial that uh, compared the 5-day and 10-day uh, remdesivir and the second one obviously was sort of a cohort observational study.
so so this is an interesting paper i wish to deliberate in this uh, video uh, so this this i would urge the readers to go through this paper it's a good paper because as you see the ckd or aki patients are deprived of whatever benefit of remdesivir by not giving because of the contraindication uh, which is which comes out from the uh, you know from the information of the uh, of the drug uh, that is uh, given and uh, even uh, CKD patients were excluded from all the trials. So the title is Remdesivir in Patients with Acute or Chronic Kidney Disease. So this came in Journal of American Society of Nephrology which is a good journal. So, so the, in severe COVID it has been reported that the AKI occurs in 20 to 40 percent of the patients of severe COVID do develop AKI and uh, the end stage kidney disease I am sure all the listeners would agree that the CKD patients are more vulnerable to have severe form of a COVID. So they are at an increased risk of exposure because they do come to hospital facility or healthcare facility for undergoing dialysis, which means they are at a higher risk of exposure and they are at an increased risk of severe infection because of whatever uh, immunocompromised state they may be in. And uh, the half-life of remdesivir and I told you remdesivir is a pro-drug. So when you take remdesivir, half-life is very short, one to two hours. When I say pro-drug, once it is given as an infusion in the body, it gets converted into an active component. And the active metabolite has a much longer half-life, 20 to 25 hours. So, so the active metabolite is possibly what may create problem for kidney disease is what you can hypothesize. And 74% of the remdesivir gets excreted by the kidneys. So that is where you see the contraindication arising. And the, the key component which is being recognized as a toxic component is sulfur butyl ether cyclodextrin. So that's the compound, SBECD is called. Sulfur butyl ether cyclodextrin is a metabolic component or a metabolite which causes toxicity to the kidney and how does it cause it does causes injury to the mitochondria in the tubular cells and it can cause necrosis in the tubules and it also causes tubular obstruction so typically you see there is a tubular obstruction that this active component called uh, sulfur butyl ether cyclodextrin causes and this is found this renal toxicity of injury to the mitochondria tubular obstruction happens at a dose Please uh, pay little attention to this at a dose 50 to 100 fold higher than the dose that is used in COVID-19 and 100 mg of remdesivir in animal models has shown to produce 3 to 6 grams of sulfur butyl ether cyclodextrin which is a toxic metabolite which has an effect on the kidney and at the, but at the dosage that one would give uh, so it does not produce these high levels because the safety threshold is less than 250 milligrams per kg per day of SBECD which means your SBECD should be less than 250 milligram per kg. If you take a 60 kg individual it should be less than 15 grams. Uh, so which means 3 to 6 grams which is produced by 100 mg remdesivir is not going to be toxic. So that's what one could deduce. And it was found from this uh, initial trial that came in Lancet that uh, remdesivir did not have any renal adverse effects in patients they had used. And even from a large study that came in NEGM in Ebola, there was no renal side effects that was uh, witnessed with remdesivir. And uh, because of the accumulation and it does cause typically necrosis in the liver also. Uh, so it is suggested that remdesivir has to be discontinued if the AST ALT rise is more than five times the baseline. And most of the evidence for this toxic metabolized sulfur butyl ether cyclodextron comes from the oriconazole studies. And it has been interestingly found this toxic metabolite sulfur butyl ether cyclodextrin is removed by conventional hemodialysis or RCRC. That's a good news for all the nephrologists that even if it produces cyclobut uh, sulfur butyl ether cyclodextrin which is a toxic component but when in CKD patients are dialyzed this is eliminated, this is removed from the dialysis. Even a transient AKI, uh, so this uh, the levels it would reach is much much lesser than the toxic levels which is more than uh, 150 milligram per kg or more than 15 grams of this that should be present. So in the dosage we administer at 100 mg per day, it does not achieve to 15 grams. The maximum it would achieve even in acute kidney injury would be 5 to 6 grams. So that's what this paper elucidates.
So the conclusions the paper makes, which is very, very important in the current pandemic situation is the benefits of remdesivir outweighs the risk uh, even at an estimated GFR of less than 30 ml per minute because currently we are not administering remdesivir in a CKD patients or AKI where your GFR is less than 30 or 50 ml per minute. So this possibly has to be debunked uh, at least if you have to subscribe to the science of this paper and even the authors go on to say in any patients uh, on CKD patients or on hemodialysis or a transient AKI where you would foresee that it, they would recover administering remdesivir is considered safe. So this is a very important message that comes out from this uh, manuscript or this uh, article that is published in a good journal, Journal of American Society of Nephrology. So possibly uh, after uh, having gone through this uh, paper, so we could possibly conclude that we could safely continue to use remdesivir in CKD patients who are on dialysis or in AKI where uh, we foresee good recovery happening and uh, and some or whatever measures we take even if AKI has to go for a dialysis you know, I think the benefit of using remdesivir far outweighs the any sort of a remote risk so that is what we can conclude from this paper and this paper beautifully summarizes uh, all these four studies that we have reviewed uh, as to the estimated GFR which was a cutoff for excluding the patients as you see the first study excluded when GFR was 30 or less and the second one eliminated the patients where GFR was less than 50, the third one eliminated when GFR was less than 30 and the fourth one also eliminated patients with GFR less than 30. So all the studies so far, the four studies we reviewed have excluded patients whose GFR was less than 50 or 30 to 50. So thank you very much. So I would end my talk with this uh, beautiful quote, we live in a universe that responds to what we believe. So, so let's all stay strong in our belief that we'll vanquish this uh, raging pandemic. Uh, so thank you very much folks and uh, if you wish to rehear to this lecture, you can uh, visit my website www.drpadiprangapa.com uh, to rehear and gain clarity and insights into this topic. Thank you very much.
lymphedema, we talked about COPD. What about hypoxic respiratory failure due to any pneumonia or infection? This was again study from UK, uh, meta-analysis of 8 randomized controlled trials, 461 patients. ICU mortality, there was 17% absolute risk reduction with the use of NIV as compared to the standard. And intubation rate also, there was 23% reduction in absolute risk reduction. And this was another uh, study from the Spain, 105 patients uh, were in pneumonia, hypoxemic respiratory failure. They compared NIV and standard. As you see, ICU mortality was 18% compared to 39% and intubation rate also was low. So even in hypoxemic respiratory failure due to pneumonia or any infection, use of NIV was found to be better in reducing the mortality and intubation. So this was again a US study which showed hospital mortality was reduced and intubation rate was reduced. So, in what about in immunocompromised? So, in immunocompromised patients also, it is shown that the use of NIV reduces the ICU mortality and reduces the ICU length of stay, reduces the intubation rate. So, in immunocompromised, early usage of NIV is what is recommended. It does significantly reduce your risk of intubation. And what are the predictors of NIV failure? Anyone who is on a vasopressors, which means they are hemodynamically unstable. So, they are at a risk of failing the NIV trial or anyone who is on renal replacement therapy. Uh, basically, anyone who is going into other secondary organ dysfunction, they are at a risk of NIV failure. And this is very important. So, the failure of NIV is when there is a delay in administration of NIV from the admission. So, when there is an increased time lag between the admission and the initiation of NIV, it is shown they possibly fail. So, the sooner you use, better is the outcome. That's why you would see in heart failures, initiation of NIV in ER itself may help them get better fast than waiting for them to reach ICU and then initiating. So that also is an important factor to remember. So other conditions where NIV can be used is in post-extubation. Suppose you have intubated a patient with uh, say pulmonary edema or heart failure. When you extubate, anticipating that they may go back into pulmonary edema or they, uh, they may go back to retaining CO2, you can extubate them to NIV. That is also and pre-intubation uh, giving a trial of NIV so that to recruit alveoli and to pre-oxygenate lung effectively before intubation also is something that could be done. And someone who is on end of life who would not want intubation, you can give a trial of NIV and end it there. So, to, to the final slide on summary and recommendation. So, NIV as you all have understood that it is ventilation by non-invasive means through a mask of some sort either by a face mask or a nasal mask or by the helmet mask and grade 1A recommendation for NIV is in COPD. So in COPD 1A means strong recommendation, good level of evidence for COPD. So as you saw 95% of the COPD should get a trial of NIV before contemplating intubation and grade 1A strong recommendation, good level of evidence in cardiogenic pulmonary edema because you saw multiple studies at least 6 to 7 studies we showed equiocally improvement in mortality, reducing the length of stay and reducing the need for intubation. And grade 2B is weak recommendation with a moderate level of evidence is hypoxic respiratory because you saw three studies even in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure due to aspiration or pneumonia, it did have a benefit at least in mild cases in reducing the mortality, reducing the risk of intubation and prevents recurrent mm -hmm. respiratory failure. And the most important thing is initiating as soon as possible uh, before you know they worsen would be the key essence in improving the outcomes. And if there is no improvement after you initiate, then obviously you may have to plan for intubation. And most importantly, NIV is very safe. There are no deleterious. You saw the side effects are very few. So there is no huge side effect profile. So, but you, you have to bear in mind some of the contraindications for using. So thank you very much. So if you wish to rehear to this lecture, you can visit my website www.drpradeeprangappa.com to rehear and clarify some of your thoughts. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always write to me. So thank you all.